Hey everyone! Hello Kahal Kadosh Beit Elohim, it's great to see you again. We are here in the ancient city of Caesarea, right on the Mediterranean coast. Uh, you know what? Don't go anywhere, I'm going to come to you. <laughs> We're standing in the theater of what was the city of Caesarea. Caesarea is a city that sits about halfway along the coast between Jaffa to the south of us and Haifa to the north of us. The city itself was built by King Herod. King Herod, who was a Jewish king during the Roman period, with heavy emphasis on the Ish. There's an interesting story there, but we won't get into it right now. Now, in the early days of King Herod, who comes to power in the year 37 before the Common Era, well, his patron was Mark Anthony. But at a certain point, Mark Anthony is going to be ousted by Augustus Caesar. And in order to show his loyalty to Augustus, well, Herod's going to go ahead and say, Mark Anthony who? You know what, Augustus, let me build you a city. And I'm going to call that city Caesarea. Now this theater here, this was the epitome of Roman culture. And Herod was going to make sure that all of Rome knew that he was more Roman than the Romans. There's so much to see in this space, 4,500 seats or so, that today is used as a venue for concerts. If you play Caesarea, you have made it in the Israeli music scene. Now looking out, you see a beautiful view of the Mediterranean Sea. When Herod comes here, like the Romans, he's going to look at the beautiful view and he's going to say, Neh, I can do better. Why? It wasn't about nature and beauty that you could see. It was about beauty that you could create. And it would be a huge wall behind the stage and all the scenery would be there. This, again, was the essence of Roman culture. What else did Herod build here in Caesarea? Let's go check it out. Palace of King Herod. Not too shabby after Herod dies. This becomes the palace of the procurators, the local governors who were here. Because when Herod dies, there's Herod Jr. At a certain point, there'll be Herod Jr. Jr. And then at a certain point, the Romans are fed up with these Jews and they place procurators over Judea, like they had anywhere else in any Roman province anywhere in the world. A hippodrome. Roman chariot races gladiatorial events and with enough room for 10,000 cheering fans in the bleachers. There were even box seats for specially invited guests from Rome. This hippodrome wasn't just because Herod liked horses. The hippodrome is because, well, Romans like hippodromes and again Herod is going to be more Roman than the Romans. Now. Herod has a very interesting story, and we could go on and on and on, but we, we're not going to. In fact, there's a moment in time that I just want to mention that takes place in the year 135 to the Common Era. This is three years after another revolt begins against Rome. It's called the Bar Kokhba Revolt. There was a spiritual leader named Rabbi Akiva, and there was a military leader named Shimon Bar Kokhba. When that rebellion is over, and as I mentioned, we lost. Bar Kokhba, the general, will die, and Rabbi Akiva and the rabbinic leadership of the Jewish people will be brought here to Caesarea. But it was in that arrest of these ten rabbinic leaders, including Rabbi Akiva, that we would see what potentially could have been the end of Jewish life here in the land of Israel, because each of these rabbis, these leaders, were executed, and Rabbi Akiva is given the choice. You can renounce your Judaism. You can promise never to ordain any more rabbis. You can promise never to teach Torah again. And we could end this right now with no pain involved. And Rabbi Akiva realizes that, well, perhaps that isn't the way to go. And as the flames are lapping up and, well, I won't get into the gruesome details, the last words on his lips before he passes Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And he dies. Now, it wouldn't be right for me to say whether this was the right choice or the wrong choice. All I can tell you is that I can imagine why he did what he did. Perhaps to inspire, perhaps to 
promise further generations that we wouldn't give in. Although I can see the argument as to, is it better to die than to live your life, even if it means not living as a Jew? Interesting questions. But one thing I know for sure as I sit here in the state of Israel, in the land of Israel, we sit amongst Roman ruins, even as we discuss what happened so long ago. Clearly, somebody must have been inspired by these actions not to do the same thing, not to die for your faith and your religion necessarily, more importantly, to live. And there's real power in that.